the Truffle Flexible Fund is a mandate to beat inflation by 5% per annum and has the flexibility to vary the fund 100% between equity and cash. Since its inception in September 2009, it has delivered returns of 18.7% per annum, far in excess of the benchmark. The fund has quietly been selling its exposure to defensive counters in favor of resource companies. And here to discuss his views is Charles. Charles, thanks for your time. So what have you been doing? What have you been selling? What have you been buying? Well, Godfrey, the first thing we've been doing is we've been selling equities in general. And that's largely a function of the fact that the market has done quite well. And we just think that the downside risks are starting to, to increase. So what we've done in the last quarter or two is we've gone down from about 80% in our total equity exposure down to about 70. Right. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that quite a few of the defensive stocks, and one notes in particular the, um, the, the retail stocks, and some of the healthcare stocks have done extremely well. Mm -hmm. So we've, we've, uh, we had exposure to those and we've now lightened them a bit in favor of resource companies. Interestingly, our, our valuation models are, s are showing that the relative valuation of resource stocks compared with the defenses are, or is as extreme as it was in 1998 at the bottom of the resource cycle. Now, at, the, at that time, if one had invested in resource stocks, it would have been an extremely rewarding exercise. So when, one can't say for sure that, that we're into the same type of experience, yeah. but just the valuations are, are very supportive, in our view, of resource stocks at the moment over the more defensives, which have got quite expensive. Yeah, so share us the thinking behind that. Well, we think what's happened on, on the defensive side is, is, is clearly we're in an uncertain market. And markets, tend to go for safety under those circumstances. So in, you know, investors have bought into some of the retailers where, let, let's be honest, there, there are some tailwinds, the, the earnings growth has been very strong and likely to remain strong. So I mean, these are great companies. We're not, we're not arguing in any sense that they're bad companies. It's just that the price that we're paying for them at the moment, in our view, is a bit high. Charles, just to drill into that resource question a, l a little bit more, obviously, uh, you mentioned that uh, trough in 1998 when resource counters looked extremely cheap and you said that the valuations are approaching those uh, at the moment. Uh, what happened between 1998 and, and the today's date is obviously we had the Chinese, the Chinese uh, super cycle and we know that they're responsible for most of the demand at the margin for some of these materials. What's your outlook for China and is it expected to consume as, as, as many commodities uh, in the next 12 years as it has in the past 12 years. Yeah, we're, we're an outlook for China is interesting because in, in, in some senses we are less optimistic about China simply because the economy is bigger. So the bigger the economy, the more difficult it is to grow. So, so I think that we are toning down the, the growth expectations for, for China a bit. But on the other hand, dropping our growth from 9% to 7% is still pretty strong growth. So we would still expect there to be quite a robust demand for, for commodities uh, you know, right across the, the board. So I think China is still going to be an engine for, for commodity growth uh, for a couple of years into the future. Mm. Just in terms of that resource uh, exposure, you've also indicated that you've been buying uh, some of the gold equities. Um, we've, we have this constant debate on the show around gold uh, physical versus the gold equities. Can you give us some insight as to why you've been buying the gold equities? Okay, that's an interesting one. The, the, the primary reason for buying the gold, I guess, is that th they tend to be counter-cyclical, so that you know, they would be weak in a strong market and strong in a, in a, in a weak market. And, and, I, and I guess there's a bit of defensive nature in, in trying to do that. So w when, when we felt that markets were starting to get high, uh, not only did we sell equities in general, but we started to move into gold beca because of that counter-cyclical quality that they have. You have not been looking at the strikes in this country and uh, you know, postulating that perhaps going forward there's going to be a shortage of gold on the gold market, on the, on the international markets and therefore buy these gold miners? Well, g gold is interesting <laughs> and, and it is very different from platinum. Yeah. Um, firstly, I guess most of the unrest is taking place in platinum, but that's not to say that gold can't be affected. But the interesting thing about gold is if you look at the South African companies, Quite a lot of their operations, in fact, are not in South Africa. Mm -hmm. they, they, they are global, so one has got protection there. And, and, and also, gold is, is different from platinum in that it's not really consumed. So the, the above ground supply of gold is, is quite high. So the sort of short-term supply demand dynamics may be not quite as strong 
in gold as, as it is in platinum. So I, I don't think there's going to be too much of an impact on the price of gold. There may well be in platinum. You indicated uh, to us that before the show that you do own platinum counters as well. Could you just tell us uh, how you deal with that when you see uh, something like an event like Marikana? Do portfolio managers head for the exits? What's the right thing to do when you have this, this uh, black swan event taking place in, yeah. in, a, in a portfolio? Warren, we bought our platinum shares before these issues. So it's been a very difficult question because there's no, there's no doubt in our mind that there's value. And if we prepare to look past the current uncertainty in the platinum industry, we think there's very good value. So the, the question then is, does one sell now just because the, the current outlook looks really bad, or do we have the patience to stick it out? Now, now we are long-term investors, and, and our, our view is that the crisis will pass. There will be some sort of accommodation. To be honest, we don't know whether there's going to be more trouble in between. There may well be. But ultimately, the industry will settle down, and, and we think that the, the current prices are too low. So, so is it almost pointless to, to do a forecast then on supply and demand? I mean, we see Johnson Matthew, one of the industry's uh, experts on the sort of platinum supply and demand balance. When you say long-term investing, it often implies that you, you need to almost look beyond the immediate earnings horizon of the next few years and take heart in the fact that the cycles do turn around. Is it the basis for making that investment? Yeah, w w we're in the approach that we take when we look at companies is, is not so much looking at the macro. So, so when we look at a platinum company, it's not looking at the platinum price and saying, well, the, the price is going to, to rise by a certain percentage, because we really don't know. And, and I think history has, has told us that not many people are very good at forecasting those sort of macro variables. But what we do look at is the, the, the micro valuation of companies and businesses, so that if if companies like, for example, Lonmin and Anplatz and Implatz, etc., are, are trading at, at cheap multiples compared with their, their past, that gives us uh, an encouragement to, to then in invest in those stocks. Mm. Let's come back to your portfolio here on uh, the Flexible Fund. And I was just looking at the companies that you have in there, Anglo-American, Steinoff, Old Mutual, Sassel, MTN. I'm seeing you one theme that's emerging out of all that, very rand uh, what do you call it? Rand, Rand hedge. Uh, Rand hedge is here. Is that the thinking? Well, it, it's, it's not directly that, but to the extent that we've moved into resource stocks, I, I guess you can say that that's been a consequence of it, but it hasn't been particularly a view on the Rand. Now, I, I, I know that in the last couple of days the Rand has been quite weak. In fact, today I think it's very weak. Uh, but it hasn't been on that thesis. It's really been on the thesis that, for example, Anglo American is trading at pretty much at its net asset value. Now, history has told us in the past that, that buying a company like Anglo American at its NAV has been fairly rewarding. So, so we're hoping that that will be so in, into the future. So it hasn't really been a RAND play. It's been more stock-specific play. Is it time to think about the RAND? Because uh, everyone you talk to, the factors stacked against the RAND are huge. I mean, we're talking about the mining unrest. We're talking about uh, the uncertainty, uncertainty created by the uh, discussions around Mangawung. We talk about the triple, uh, sorry, uh, twin deficits that are coming back into the South, South African market. So you've got a capital account that's going out of whack. You've got your budget deficit that's probably going to come under pressure because how do you solve all these other issues in your uh, national state? Godfrey, I, I guess all of the fundamentals at the moment are negative on the RAND. Absolutely. So, you know, you can't argue the fact that the RAND is likely to weaken. But, you know, in our view, it's a very difficult thing to get right in, in the long run. And, and yes, we might have a short-term spike downwards in the RAND. It, it might happen. But then when things settle down, it might strengthen again. So, so to be honest, we don't know where the RAND is going to go. And we don't base our investment decisions on that one directional movement in the RAND. We would rather look at, at, at businesses and say, w what should this business be valued at over a cycle? Mm -hmm. and, and that, in, in our mind, is, is, a, is a much better way of analyzing and looking at businesses. Just in terms of uh, taking this particular portfolio, and it's, uh, we've mentioned the Rand Hedge stocks, you've also got some exposure via your top 10 holdings in a, in a company called India Bulls Financial Services. Could yes. you just tell us a little bit about yes. that company, because I've yes. never heard of it before. That's right. It's, a, it's, an, it's a, a financial services company that operates out of India. 
its, its main market is in home finance. And the, the thesis in India Bulls is that the um, mortgage market in India is, is very immature and likely to grow dramatically in, in the next couple of years. So there's a lot of blue sky potential in India Bulls. And it's a company that, that we know and we like the management. So, th so the combination of r really a great industry to be in, which is only just emerging in, in, into the economy, um, and good management, we, th we think is, is going to be uh, quite rewarding in the future. Mm. And, and outside of the top 10, are there any others that, uh, any other companies that you've, you've bought overseas um, based on a, a thesis of one type or another? We've got Imperial Tobacco. That, that is more just a defensive play and simply that our assessment is that the valuation of Imperial is better than BAT, B-A-T. So th that's just a sort of a, s a substitute investment for the domestic BAT. We've also got uh, some exposure to Tesco in, in the UK. Uh, that, that's another one that we like, yeah.